Klebalo, um, to invite me. Today, I'm going to talk about four subject area. The first thing I'm going to share you briefly with the history of forensic science. Then I'm going to, since I'm not a student, so I will share my life story as a forensic scientist. I've been in forensic science for 64 years now. And uh, after that, I will talk a little bit about current procedure we use and uh, future advances uh, in forensic science. And the last area I'm going to talk about, just give you a couple cases, how the molecular biology and other physical evidence can be used to solve the case. Uh, also, I'm going to give you one case example, how you know, difficult today uh, with the news media court, uh, lawyers and forensic scientists sometimes get blamed for something nothing scientifically wrong and uh, it's so important to keep detailed records and to understand the songs. So let's get uh, started. Forensic science actually have a long history. Early days in Europe and Asia, um, autopsy already exists for many years. The first medical legal autopsy book was published 1248 in China. And uh, the development of forensic toxicology and drugs and the chemistry won't uh, fully uh, become a scientific view until 18th century. At the same time, uh, human identification, early days, uh, we use anthropometric method, the measurement and uh, photograph. Then uh, by 18th century, uh, we start look at a, a fingerprint. Uh, the fingerprint system was introduced uh, 1887 and uh, uh, the Cla Henry's classification subsequently used around the world. Trace evidence was become a few of a forensic science uh, by the late 18th century, uh, early 19th century, um, Professor Lokar introduced his famous transfer theory. Based on his theory, when two objects or two persons have physical contact, their trace material exchange in the boundary line. That established the fundamental uh, principle of uh, forensic evidence. But today, as we know, uh, many of the physical evidence was transferred not by direct contact, could be a secondary contact or secondary transfer or maybe even airborne. That's so-called linkage theory. Uh, of course, today we, uh, the instrumentation, big database, we have so many books uh, published regards to different field of forensic science. The linkage theory is more uh, appropriate today. is how to link the crime scene to a victim, uh, to evidence, to a suspect. And uh, even you found a linkage, not necessary, a definitive proof uh, the victim suspect have a uh, direct uh, involvement in this case. And today also forensic science becomes so specialized. When I studied the forensic field that time, we call generalist. It's somebody, a person we know everything a little bit, but today forensic science, just like medicine law and uh, other scientific discipline, we approach to specialization. We have a separate field called forensic pathology and uh, forensic odontology. The dentist 
um, use dental technique to identify a person or compare dental by mark, forensic anthropology, forensic entomology, forensic radiology. Also, we have a few forensic nursing, forensic psychology, forensic engineer, forensic toxicology. At the same, uh, talking the criminalistic view, uh, which besides fingerprint, imprint, firearm, toe mark, document examination, those traditional comparison technique, of course, drug, try to uh, trace evidence, biological evidence, and uh, e-crime evidence. The application of forensic science also changed tremendously. Early days only applied to criminal cases, but now all those major civil litigation cases all involving forensic science. Besides our national security, um, terrorist attack, all those war crime involving forensic evidence. In addition, natural man-made uh, accident, uh, identification of a human remain. We also involving consumer protection, uh, full water safety, environment, protection and uh, historical uh, integrity verification. So forensic view is uh, expand tremendously. There are about 490 forensic laboratory in the United States. They probably close to a thousand forensic laboratory around the world. Uh, generally, we can divided by the following type of services. A full service laboratory, basically they provide uh, biological, chemical, um, of course, uh, autopsy, everything, uh, the service. The partial, there are some partial forensic service laboratory and limited, for example, uh, DA laboratory just do drug, uh, in the United States, post office laboratory, just involving document examination. Some just do autopsy, such as a, a lot of a, a hospital, university laboratory. Some are just doing DNA, genetic testing, and uh, other, they're specialized in product testing. Early days, forensic people will basically play a supporting role to support a uh, investigator, detective, uh, investigate case. But today, more and more cases, forensic scientists will become play a leading role in charge of the investigation. Also, laboratory automation. We have a big database now, such as NIBANG, FS, system also start using artificial intelligence, facial recognition, and uh, we also started friend of you, collect the evidence, analyze, and search the database, um, become a continuous uh, service to the community. As I say, the database is uh, besides uh, we talk about fingerprint, DNA, in addition to firearm, trace evidence, so many different databases now. Um, a lot of newer technique involved, such as image enhancement, digital video recording analysis, crime scene side identification, electronic monitor, artificial intelligence, biometric, big data, cloud computing, crime mapping, crime and analytic analysis and fraud deception, uh, all those star into the forensic view. Uh, DNA, of course, in recent year, uh, become an, another major uh, area in forensic view, not only to, for victims identification, a mass disaster, a war crime, um, mass murder, 
all different type of identification. Uh, for example, here we work with Florida and ValueJet uh, crash. Um, hundreds of people die, blew in pieces, and uh, um, Everglades. So to collect those sample, try to identify. And uh, of course, DNA uh, for victim identity, suspect identification, hold responsible. Uh, we can extract DNA from food, uh, cam, silver cam, beer bottle, uh, bomb parts, all different things. And many cases now, of course, DNA can provide investigative lead, such as um, uh, we talk about cold cases or serial killer case. You probably all heard forensic genealogy, uh, familial DNA. Those are the application in addition cold case. Uh, all those boxes, those are rape kit. In other words, in the United States, we have about 1 million sexual assault cases. The clearance rate is pretty low, only 50%. Most of the rape cases are unsolved. So now with a big DNA database, and uh, those call cases start solving now uh, with the DNA, uh, more and more cold case murder, uh, a lot of uh, new equipment being used in uh, DNA field, the third generation of uh, a sequencer, and uh, in addition, a lot of uh, new advanced rapid DNA testing, microbial DNA, animal plant DNA, uh, being applied into forensic. Familial DNA search become a, a, a important part of a, a search linkage testing and uh, try to identify the suspect at the victim. Uh, in addition, rapid DNA, data bank. So that provide an opportunity uh, for forensic genealogy um, through solving case, through genetic uh, software recognition and uh, autosomal uh, single nucleotide search, uh, many cold cases being solved. And, uh, so many uh, body parts being identified through that. Um, of course, anytime a new technique, uh, new methodology introduced in the United States after a while, uh, the lawyer going to against it. Uh, they think this search is in, um, in front of an individual right. So already have a three state passed the law, limit the police use this search technique. Another area become a, have a major advances is e crime, electronic evidence. Uh, more and more cases uh, committed, such as uh, um, fraud and uh, uh, subtype and uh, uh, data infringe, all those. So we said big data information search become uh, uh, important. Another area recently, biometric database combined the fingerprint DNA, retina, uh, other biological marker together as a major uh, uh, data bank. And uh, a lot of police departments start using CCTV camera, other computer view, phone records, uh, try to combine all the data together, become a big data search engine, uh, try to find a suspect and uh, try to reconstruct through artificial intelligence uh, biometric system. Using that, start doing the crime map, crime analysis, uh, location, geographic mapping, timeline analysis, uh, with 
all of those uh, CCTV TV camera all over the street corner. Now, uh, forensic field face another major challenge uh, to enhance the quality of the tape and the facial recognition. Uh, what's the future? Of course, the monitor, every vehicle, every individual, and uh, through uh, microelectronic and uh, optic electronic monitor. Uh, so that's basically, it's good, but on the other hand, this individual's uh, uh, privacy is no longer exists anymore. Uh, of course, they're talking about robot cops, robot doctor, and uh, probably future, you're going to have a robot for six scientists too, to do routine tests. Um, they, in addition, of course, they talk about the interview of the suspect uh, with a database, uh, data chips in your lens. So individuals uh, whole life history, it's in, um, in front of you. So if an individual uh, lied to you right away, you don't need the lie detector or polygraph. Uh, you already can verify the information. Another future technology uh, is brand net linkage, linkage uh, between the world. In other words, many times the forensic um, cases Besides need good physical evidence, good information, good detective investigation, sometimes you need the logic mind to analyze that. So with that, they can link the, all the uh, world forensic scientists with other scientists together and try to communicate through uh, uh, virtual analysis. So basically solving the case is we have to recognize the information. Then we collect those information. From the information, we use a logic approach to solve, analyze, uh, try to figure out motive, means uh, opportunity. But where's the information come from? How to recognize? That become very important aspect of forensic training. Information, not like early days, think only come from the witnesses or physical evidence. Now information can directly from the crime scene. But you have to recognize it because at the crime scene, you only have one chance, one opportunity. If you missed it, it's gone forever. Physical evidence, eyewitnesses, other witnesses, then data money. Also, we need public information. A detective can generate intelligence. So, once we combine those information, then we we'll use C analytic and the forensic analytic method to analyze and solve the crime. Data information and intelligence is different. In forensic field, even more important. Data, you do an experiment or you talk to somebody, you generate data. That's not necessarily is valuable information. Sometimes nothing to do with the case. Intelligence is something you have to link to the case. So in other words, data is all over the place. So we have to organize the data become information. Random information, we use linkage theory. 
generate intelligence. Then we assess, evaluate, and we become knowledge. Those are the valuable intelligence which we can use to solve the case. Cramsey, it's no longer like the early days, a location or a body. Crime scene today can as big as a whole Manhattan. 9-11 physical evidence actually cover a whole island of a Manhattan. Value gen, the whole Everglades, the ocean. Computer, cell phone, also it's a universal crime scene. Then we have a microscopic, microscopic crime scene. For example, victim's eyes or teeth, the full residue between the teeth, pollen particle in the eyes can give us information. Victim's fingernail, we can find hairs or blood or the pattern, footprint, Fingerprint, piece of paper, they all can be considered as a crime scene. So 21st century, the crime scene concept, it's no longer just a person or a location can be encompassed on everything. The crime scene documentation is important, but the crime scene analysis is equally important. For example, this case, police initially think it's a traffic accident on the highway. When they request forensic assistance, when we get there, as you notice, the decedent's pants were stopped. So how many of you drive a car with your pants stopped? So that's a silent language, tell us, something important here. That's not a traffic accident. It's a homicide and uh, subsequently the body was dumped outside. Her body was found in the park. This car was shoot up. Everything you have to know how to read the crimes, not just take the photograph and pictures. Another change in crime scene is we start bringing the laboratory to the scene. Early days is collect the evidence, take the evidence back to the lab to analyze. Now we take more and more so-called portable instrument to do the scene analysis. Rapid DNA is one example. Portable GC mass pack is another example. So, uh, forensic examination, the first stage actually start at the scene. We should recognize, document, and collect. Then identify, then transfer to the laboratory, evaluate, exam, then individualize it, make a proper interpretation. Then the third stage, equally important, is testify in court. We have to uh, report our funding to court, and make sure uh, deliver uh, the correct interpretation to jury and judge. Power observation. Most of the molecular biologist student developed that. Forensic scientists also have to develop that. For example, her body found in the park. We have 20 detective forensic scientists, medical examiner. Everybody look at the body, but we know that's a female. What else? The blood stand is located in the back, 
isolated area. Then as you can see this picture, the blood wasn't dry yet. So how long to take that blood to dry? It give us a parameter, the time of the death. Victim has no panty or undergarment. So lack of evidence equally important as the presence of evidence. Whether or not we can find any evidence on her body, that's one of the first case we develop a potential fingerprint on human skin. Of course, as you can see here, she doesn't have shoes. She was barefooted, but no grass, no soil on the saw of her foot, which suggests us her body was carried to this national park. She was killed in this location. So homicide, this is a primary location, but the whole case could be a secondary or tertiary location. So crime scene analysis actually tell us a lot of story about this case and uh, the direction of investigation. We just talk about evidence can come from a different shape, different form. So just for example, this fire scene, when we get there, we see five different color, dark red, that probably tell us 970 degree Fahrenheit. Cherry red, that's about 1200 degree Fahrenheit. Yellowish, cherry red is hotter, 14, then yellow and bright white. That tells us multiple origin. Different thing is burning. That's a suspicious fire. Fingernail with nail polish. Livility. That tells us this person died of a carbon monoxide. So all those information we have to recognize and preserve. Then we start study the pattern, land and groove of a bullet, fingerprint or charring, degree of charring, direction of charring, the ripping pattern, all give us information. So pattern evidence, besides traditional pattern fingerprint, handprint, glove, by mark, handwriting, even MO, Medusa Brenda, is a pattern. In addition, voice analysis, cutting mark. Today, even the DNA, the pattern, is a pattern evidence. So some of the pattern at the scene, we need chemical enhancement. For example, her body was found in the kitchen floor. We use chemical enhancement. We develop this shoe print, suspect shoe print. Subsequently, we compare with suspect shoe print, identify them on the shoes. We was able to find some small amount of blood spatter and with DNA analysis linked to the victim's blood type DNA. So as you can see, the forensic scientists, the involvement, not just do DNA. We start with recognition, identification, enhancement, comparison, and laboratory analysis, Finally, we report the case. So logic is something which is so important 
for Voris Exontist. We look at a crisis with a logic mind. We can interact the intelligence with database analysis and uh, generate enough information for a newest DNA testing, then we can reconstruct and find out what did happen. I've been in forensic field for 64 years now. I started my career in 1960 as a police captain in Taiwan. 1965, I come to United States, study at the NYU Medical Center, uh, finish my uh, doctor degree in molecular biology. Then I start working at the University of New Haven, 1976, joined the state police. And uh, until year 2002, uh, then I, uh, in 1998, I become the commissioner for Connecticut State Police and Public Safety in charge of the police operation. Uh, and uh, 19, year 2010, I retire again, back to the university, and uh, we work in an institute. I spend a lot of time at the crime scene, a lot of time in the laboratory, a lot of time in the courtroom, of course, a lot of time in the classroom. A lot of people say I made impossible become possible. At the beginning, it's pretty difficult, but uh, waste a lot of a uh, good colleague worked with me, we was able to develop a few of forensic signs. Uh, we help a lot of country work on different cases. And uh, uh, I did to receive numerous uh, medals, commendation work, I received a 30 honorary doctor degree. And, uh, uh, but I want to share with everybody success has come from hard work. If you work hard, uh, you definitely going to succeed. And uh, I even have my own television show now and uh, being appear on many um, uh, network. Uh, not long ago, the list 10 most famous for six scientists from 18th century to 21st century. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy and uh, uh, they list me as number one. Then subsequently when I look at uh, five out of 10 already passed away. So I was talking to the organizer. I say, is this a message? I'm the next one to go. As a matter of fact, a lot of all uh, historical book they start putting my picture on the book. So I be already become a piece of the history. Uh, people most impressed with my work is basically, uh, I have worked with 47 country, you investigate about 8,000 some cases. So I'm going to share some of those cases with you later. Not too long ago, USA Today list 25 headline, 25 event shaped the world history. For example, Berlin Wall, 9-11 attack, Iraq war, Kara Krinchina, OJ Simpson. So when they send that copy to me, I found out 14 out of 25 cases, we directly, indirectly involved. We directly involved in I, one one investigation. We also involving Iraq war, victim identification, wrongful shooting of the military people, hurricane identification, OJ something, Clinton, Monica, Afghanistan, Oklahoma bombing, and uh, that's of Diana, all those cases. 
that time, I'm still with the uh, state police. We sent two rescue team to helping New York City police to search the rubble. Myself with uh, 14 DNA scientists, we're helping to identify human remains. In 1993, I was asked to participate, dig up the mass grave to identify those victims' body and uh, uh, in investigation. In 1998, Congress set up another committee that asked me to reinvestigate President Kennedy uh, assassination, try to reconstruct what did happen, how did it happen, what the possible sequence you meant. Many people say this case changed the modern US history. It's in June 1996, and uh, President uh, Clinton's White House Chief Counsel, Vincent Foster, was found, died in the Mercy Park, single bullet in the mouth. A special congressional committee set up. They asked me to be the chief forensic advisor. We went there to investigate. As you can see, victim's hand have a revolver. The thumb is in the trigger guard. So a lot of uh, scholar or lawyers and uh, Newspaper people think that this is planned because nobody pulled a trigger with a thumb. We all use index finger. Only forensic scientists we know. If you want to fire a gun to as somebody else, you use an index finger. If suicide, you usually reverse the gun. You use thumb, put in your mouth. So it's consistent, we say so is up. Not like the initial funding sink. This is inconsistent with so is up. In addition, we see gunpowder residue on the hand, which suggests he in fact discharged a firearm. This firearm is a homemade uh, special weapon from victim's grandfather with a big cylinder gap. In addition, we found DNA, tissue, blood spatter on the weapon. So our conclusion, said Vincent Foster commit suicide. Otherwise, if it's a homicide, uh, President Clinton probably uh, going to be impeached for murdering his best friend. But Later, because the Monica uh, uh, and Clinton uh, issue, and uh, I was asked to review the DNA result found on uh, her dress. Those in fact are semen, and uh, semen DNA was from uh, President uh, Clinton. So again, forensic evidence become a deciding uh, uh, point of an investigation. They even have a cartoon, say Dr. Lee is in the White House searching for evidence. Of course, it's not like this. Also, I'm not that bad <laughs> and uh, I'm much handsomer than what the cartoonist. We also investigate another Kennedy case and uh, nephew of Kennedy, Dr. Kennedy, uh, involved in the rape case. Uh, early days, we the DNA use RFLP. And uh, of course, as you can see, this pattern is a pattern recognition comparison. And uh, um, we was able to identify that's Willis Smith's DNA. But that only shows the DNA found is his. But DNA cannot say 
that's a rape or not a rape. So sometimes the physical evidence, not like a Professor Lockhart's original theory linkage, we only can say the piece of evidence we can link him and the victim, but whether or not that's a rape is a question mark. O.J. Simpson case, forensic evidence also play important. The DNA from the, the blood stamp from the, the scene is O.J. Simpson. Even though I'm a defense expert, I agree 100% those DNA sample is from O.J. Simpson, except as you can see on the walkway, have two drop of blood. On the evidence back, you can see the red image, which is different than original swap. You have two drop of blood, people say, what's so unusual? But as you can see, one dry, one wet. Scientifically, if a person cut himself, you two drop, drop on the surface, the same time, same day, same temperature, same receiving surface, that two drop should be identical. Either both dry or both wet. Cannot be one dry, one wet. That's called simple logic. Nothing to do with DNA analysis result. It's the logic, how to explain those. That's why I say the logic is important. Kobe Bryant case, we also investigated. And uh, again, the physical evidence, the molecular knowledge become a focal point of this investigation. But uh, as you know, this is a mixture of DNA. In other words, multiple, from multiple person. Uh, how that happened? So all of those become crucial. John Benny Renzi case, it's almost 25 years now. This case still unsolved. Is this a homicide or just on family death? So next Tuesday, we're going to have a one day uh, homicide conference going to have some expert in DNA, trace evidence, handwriting analysis. We're going to sit down, talk about any, uh, any possibility to solve this case with new scientific evidence. Shandra Levy case. This is another uh, case involving uh, US congressman, of course, uh, her body, unfortunately, wasn't found right away, uh, almost a year later. And uh, a lot of potential evidence lost. Another case, the famous uh, uh, composer, uh, musician Phil Spector. Recently, he died of COVID infection, but uh, he was charged for murder of female actresses. Uh, he claimed he's innocent and uh, she committed, uh, played the gun, uh, accidentally discharged. So, this is another mystery. So, in United States, the homicide solving rate only 70%. We have about 16,000 homicides per year. So in other words, every year, almost 5,000 uh, or more cases unsolved. Based on forensic 101, as a I say if somebody discharge a firearm, we should find gunpowder residue on his clothing, 
on like his hand and turned out no gunpowder residues was found. Yet, because her trajectory and uh, gunshot wound is inside the mouse. So this back spatter, his clothing should have a lot of blood spatter, which we did not observe. So initially, Los Angeles uh, medical examiner marked accident, accidental death, but subsequently they changed to homicide. So that's another case. Uh, in addition, we also look at uh, some historical case such as who killed Kim Tong. And uh, this case in the United States, a lot of people are interested about is Princess Poco Hondas and uh, where is her body? She supposedly in 1618, she went to England, but uh, her body never recovered. So case after case, we also work on a lot of foreign country case. This is Thailand, uh, opposition uh, legislator was found, died of a single shot in his house. Police charged his brother with murder. Uh, this case in Italy, the little girl received 10 stab wounds in the back. Uh, who did it? I was in Italy, uh, I says, in China, a farmer found a tiger in the wood. So he took some picture and publicized that picture. Turned out this tiger is a distinct spe species, not supposed to exist. So that become a important funding. However, some people think this picture is a fake. Other scientists from their National Academy of Science think this is a real picture. So they ask me to look at it. And uh, this is a picture from a calendar. So if you compare this two picture, of course, the color is different. The color, anybody can do Photoshop, they can change the color. But we look at uh, the tiger skin, those stripes is genetically controlled. So these two tiger, one is the farmer discovered in the wood, the other is an old calendar. So we change this, become black and white. As you can see, they have identical ridge pattern. Two short ridges, an island, an island, two more short ridges, bifurcation, bifurcation, trifurcation, trifurcation, a big hook, a big hook. So we think the barber just took a picture and uh, paste on the board, put in the wood, photograph that. That's why, as you can see, the tiger did not change. Uh, the tree, the leaves change because that's the same tiger, the picture. So based on our study, uh, this is a fake tiger. Subsequently, the police based on our report, searched his house and found he enlarged the tiger picture from the calendar, put on his cardboard, uh, he confessed for the case. So forensic evidence again, become a important uh, clue for the public confidence on the scientific comparison. Many other cases were involved. Some are cold cases. This case 30 years ago, she was murdered, but uh, with the new technology and fingerprint, uh, we was able to solve this old case. Cases, for example, mass killing, grandmother and two kids was murdered. We was able 
to uh, use DNA and shoe print analysis and uh, solve the case. So bottom line, so many cases we was able to solve. This case is the biggest homicide case in Chicago, mass killing, seven people working in uh, uh, Chicago, this chicken place, uh, all seven from manager to um, all the employee was murdered on January 8th. We went there in a garbage can, we found only one meal. In other words, the kitchen already closed. Have a French fry, 36 French fry, two pieces of bread, some chicken. We found most of the chicken was on eaten, intact, only the wing. We know this was saw 2107. Which means restaurant already closed. So based on scientific evidence and uh, the sales slip, we know the suspect more likely work in the restaurant, so he can get in after closing. Uh, so many year later, DNA extract from the chicken, we we was able to prove the case. Police shooting, also we investigate a lot of cases. Those cases are very sensitive. In the United States recently have so many unfortunate incidents of hate crime and police shooting case. Forensic scientists is the one to maintain the objectivity, transparency, impartial of the investigation. But today, the forensic scientists are squeezed between science and law. As a scientist, we have to report faithfully what our funding, give a proper interpretation. But unfortunately, the lawyer only want one side of the story. They don't want the total truth. They only want whatever in favor of them. For example, this case called famous staircase murder. In the United States, we have 300 million people, but we have about 13,000 staircase that per year. That's a lot of a staircase that. Most of the cases is accident, especially senior citizens or people on drug or drunk. As a matter of fact, according to CDC study, uh, the leading 15 leading cause of death uh, accident is the number three. Four is a mono accident is number one. So many staircase cases, but this one happened in uh, uh, 2000. Uh, this case, uh, Mrs. Uh, Peterson, Catherine Peterson, uh, body was found on a staircase. Her husband and uh, she was outside drinking. And uh, he stayed next to the swim pool uh, to finish the wine. She decided to go upstairs to the bedroom. And by morning two o'clock, two o'clock, he come into the house, found her wife still breathing. So call 911. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away uh, when she arrived to the hospital. But uh, Medical examiner initially determined that's an accident, but later the police think this because the beating, homicide by beating, because the blood stand. Uh, the expert testified uh, 
Mr. Peterson beat up the, his wife and uh, created a spatter. However, when we look at a crime scene, we found uh, Mrs. Peterson was uh, this uh, contact blood floating pattern indicate she fall off, uh, bleeding, get up, stand up, fall down again. So in other words, she was at the scene for quite a while. In addition, the blood spatter we found is no center, not called ghost center. Most of the whole blood you should see like this, dark and uh, have center. But uh, at the scene, the majority is wholly ghost center. So we think most likely because the blood into the lung start coughing. When you cough, you have an air bubble with the blood, the load of the blood, and uh, once hit the wall, dry, the air bubble busted, air gone. So that's why you have those uh, pattern. So have two different school of thought. In addition, we found Mrs. Uh, Peterson have a high alcohol concentration, 0.07. Legally, she is drunk. In addition, she had violent about 0.15 uh, milligram per liter. So she is intoxicated. So we try to demonstrate this in court. And uh, unfortunately, the lawyer doesn't want to believe. And uh, today, they cannot discredit the science, they discredit the scientists. They cannot discredit the scientists, they demean a witness. They call us, we're a hired gun. Even we give some testimony. If we testify for prosecution, defense lawyer going to say we're biased. And uh, jury found he's guilty. So, of course, the family feel uh, so great. And uh, make a long story short, a couple of years later, a case uh, he was convicted, and the real suspect later confessed for the crime. So, they have to release him. When they release him, they found out the same expert testified about his case is in this case. So the attorney general under fire, all those cases have to review and they found his case is subject to review from the problem. So he's released now. Of course, now, since the pandemic, everybody understand now, coughing can generate a lot of spatter. When I testify in court that time, people don't believe. Now because COVID-19, so they use high-speed camera capture. This coughing, hundreds and thousands of spatter come up. That's why I have to maintain something called social distance. Within three feet or six feet, those blood spatter can get to somebody's closing. Uh, in other words, DNA can provide some identification, but uh, what equally important is to understand how those uh, spatter was get there. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up, so we're going to end up here. We're under a lot of stress now, uh, but future uh, we is so important, and uh, the defense lawyer, prosecutor, judges, and uh, forensic scientists have to have high integrity. So let me do a test. The most Americans think what profession is honest and ethical. Number one is nurse, public trust nurse. Who is number two? Medical doctor. Number three, teacher. Number four, number five, number six. 
Those are the profession they trust. What profession they don't trust? Reporter, senator, lawyers, politician, president. Who worse than president? Car salesman. Okay, want to thank you very much. Uh, with those younger students, you have to have knowledge in your mind, have courage in your body, have honesty in your heart, uh, have pride in your life. With that, Hello, thank you very much. That was a great lecture. Now, if anyone has any question, uh, please, you can just tune in and ask the professor. You can type in the question and I will read it out loud. Okay, if no question, we can go back to that case we haven't finished. Course. They want to do that? Yeah, of course. And if anyone has any question they're going to come up with in the meantime, that's perfectly fine. Maybe people are just thinking. <laughs> we have a case just yesterday. Uh, okay. I just talk about Today, the forensic scientists have a lot of uh, 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 responsibility to maintain the truth and justice. But unfortunately, a lot of reporter twist the fact, fake news, especially web news. I personally experienced something and uh, of also have forensic laboratory people and not stand the pressure, commit suicide. This case happened in 1985. The victim, his name, George Tell. He's a retired person, lived with his wife. One night, his wife woke up, heard the noise, her husband fighting with somebody. So she jumped out of the bed, found her husband was fighting with an intruder. The intruder hit her so hard, knocked her out of conscious. When she woke up, found her husband was stabbed, uh, in the kitchen, a pool of blood. Initially, you must get her think maybe husband wife had a fight. Then subsequently, they realized quickly this is a burglar related homicide. Victim's daughter and uh, uh, son in law from victim's wallet. Wallet disappeared. So we were called to the scene and uh, at the Lononia, we was able to find a shoe print. We use chemical enhance, so come up a pattern, not shoe print, basically we call, it's a checkerboard design. It's consistent with a Puma sneaker, size 10. So the case remained under investigation for three days, but one day police received a tip and a landlord uh, owns an apartment, rented out. Uh, the talent say the toilet bowl stuck and uh, need a plumbing service. So the landlords and the plumber went there. He found two banded credit cards stuck in the toilet. 
So he gave it to a lawyer, lawyer look at uh, George Taylor. That's victim's credit card. So call the police. Police went to the suspect's home. Uh, the suspect, uh, suspect the brother showed the police his older brother had a pair of sneaker and uh, his Puma sneaker. So that's how the case was solved. 30 years later, the sneaker was sent to uh, the new laboratory for testing. 30 years later, they say no blood was found and DNA was excluded victim. In other words, the sneaker, uh, what we say, sneaker we found blood, uh, they did not find blood. What we say, uh, the sneaker, they did the DNA, exclude victim. So of course the newspaper star printing the article, twist the fact, say this case, uh, because I give you an accurate testimony, wrongful conviction, we found the blood, and they don't have blood. We, uh, we, uh, Link the suspect, uh, they say it's not suspects. But it's so important to keep all the notes and the paperwork. This is 85. Two detectives come to my house because Sunday, I have a laboratory, testing laboratory in my house in the 80s, uh, it's even better equipped than state police lab. Two of them observe, I removed the blood cross from the uh, shoes. In addition, I found some uh, glass fragment and a lalonia plastic. I tested those samples. And uh, this is the worksheet 1985, my assistant further testing the sneaker, scraping everything out of the sneaker, did the ABO typing, that time because no DNA, did the ABO, we did the anti-human, anti-human hemoglobin, we did the PGM, uh, iso enzyme, we did the uh, uh, EPA, and uh, all those genetic markers because 1985, that had no DNA. So 85, we already used up all the sample. There's no blood left. So the record, we say consistent. We did not say definitive, that's victim's blood. This is 1985, what the sneaker look like. That's before we do any testing. As you can see, they are glass fragment, small amount of blood stamp. This is later the forensic laboratory testing in 2019, 30 years later. Why the sneaker turn black? Because in between, we have a three defense expert try to uh, ink the shoe print, make a replicate to compare the blood sneaker print we found at the scene. So how they test us and no blood was found, I really don't know. In addition, they found DNA. So many people handle that. 
in between because early days when you go to court, sneaker become my evidence. The court clerk take it out from the back, hand to the prosecutor, barehanded. The prosecutor gives the judge, judge look at it barehanded. Then defense attorney exam barehanded. Then they pass the sneaker to jury one by one. Usually a homicide have two of jury plus two or four alternate. So think about how many people handle that sneaker. You find a trace among DNA, you say this is an exclusion. And uh, that you stretch the signs really over the limit. Of course, all the scientists review that we did not do anything wrong. So just two days ago, uh, uh, the Supreme Court decision come down and uh, reject the plaintiff idea, say uh, we did the uh, uh, we uh, uh, did anything wrong, and at the court, the judge ruled everything was correct. Uh, somebody read it, sent me this comment. This is a terrific, appropriate news. So, uh, so please, the truth come forward, finally, and clear up all the mis uh, miserable mistake. What the the lawyer and newspaper claim. So this basically I want people to know. Lawyer, they don't mention. Newspaper don't even mention. How the victim's credit card got to the suspect's toilet bowl. Victim already done. No person speak for him. Victim why? become paraplegic, can't give a function. Nobody speak for her. Who care about the justice? 30 years later, they think the suspect is innocent. Only forensic scientists. We let the evidence speak for the case. That's why I encourage you, the younger scientist, you have to have knowledge in your mind. Right now, you're in school, exalt the knowledge, learn. Have courage in your body. In other words, you have to speak up and testify. It's no way, doesn't matter. Whatever you find in one side going to like it, the other side definitely hate you. If you are funding in favor of prosecution, the police like you. The defendant hate you. If you're funding in favor of defendant, defendant like you, the police investigator, they hate you. So you have to have the courage to speak for the truth. Honesty in your heart. Let the evidence speak for yourself. Let the signs speak for yourself. Have friends in your life. When you feel lonely, only other scientists can help you. Your friend can talk to you. Uh, again, once again, I want to thank you. And uh, I'll consider you all my friends. If anything you need or somebody to talk to, feel free to contact my assistant and uh, uh, we continue work for science and uh, work for truth. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for that great point. We have, uh, we have uh, one question in the chat. Let me read it out, out loud for you. Um, as a representative of Department of Forensic Engineering at University of Criminal Investigation and Police Studies in Belgrade, I must say it was a pleasure uh, listening to you. 
would you be so kind to emphasize the importance of teamwork in crime solving? Um, I'm glad somebody uh, major in forensics. I of course, you know, uh, scientists, we cannot just stay in the ivory tower, just like professor. Today, the world is different now. Forensic science is an application of the natural science. It's not the pure scientific field. It's a applied scientific field. Therefore, you need both field experience, investigation experience with scientific knowledge. Then you can merge, uh, become a leading forensic scientist. Okay. Thank you very much. We also have uh, two questions from Vishnya. Uh, she asks, do you think uh, forensic science is a risky job and are forensic scientists uh, facing threats? Can you repeat the question again? Uh, yes. Do you <clears throat> think forensic science is a risky job and are forensic scientists facing threats? Okay. Uh, as I say, in the United States, I know there are about uh, 460 uh, some laboratory employ about 5,000 forensic scientists. Forensic scientists, you have a variety spectrum of different skill. And uh, for example, before I retire, I'm the chief forensic scientist. Then you have new uh, low entry one, so some people call forensic one, other laboratory called junior forensic scientists, and uh, which equivalent to a technician, require a BS degree or a master degree. Then you can move, become a forensic uh, scientist, forensic uh, scientist one, two, or supervisor, and uh, not necessary need to have an advanced degree, but however, a lot of uh, they all have PhD because uh, uh, that's more responsibility. You are in charge of section. You have to review the report, review the result. Many times have to testify, and uh, so scientific knowledge at the best degree definitely helpful. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a lot of people thanking in the comments. Comments, it seemed like they really liked the lecture. So thank you again for me and the students association. Okay, I want to thank everybody. Uh, Easter, this is a Easter week. So I guess in your country, Easter already over, right? No, actually it's coming up. Okay, so I wish everybody to have a happy Easter. And uh, when you guys have opportunity to come to United States, feel free to stop our institute. Uh, we show you around. And uh, hopefully uh, when pandemic over, I have an uh, opportunity to visit uh, your country to meet everybody, okay? It's such a great honor. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Very bye bye. Goodbye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.